Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Old South Meeting House. My name is Erica Lindemood, and I am the Education Director here at the Meeting House. And now, I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Tegan Kehoe. Tegan is currently pursuing her Master's in History and Museum Studies at Tufts University, and we are fortunate to have her as part of our education team here at Old South Meeting House. Tegan also works as a freelance history writer and independent collections manager and curator. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tegan Kehoe. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And today we'll be talking about symbols and propaganda that were created around the Boston Massacre. And this is a topic I'm very excited to be sharing with you all um, because I've uh, spoken on this topic a lot for uh, kind of history beginners, uh, both as a tour guide at a previous job, and also I do a lot of school programs here, and we touch on the Boston Massacre. And I'm really excited to be sharing this with an audience where I can go into some of the more fun details and do a little bit more analysis, because it is a really fun and interesting topic. So thank you all so much for being here. So propaganda in the American Revolution was certainly not limited to the Boston Massacre. Uh, newspapers, in particular, created visual and print propaganda throughout the 1760s. Papers began taking sides. Somewhere between half and three quarters of the population of Boston would have been literate around then, and uh, those who could read often shared the news with those who could not, either in their own homes, but it was also a popular pastime in taverns, was to share the newspaper um, and share that information with one another. Um, so these newspapers really were reaching a wide audience. And so this image, printed in response to the Stamp Act of 1765, um, is captioned an emblem of the effects of the stamp, or of the fatal stamp. Um, so there's a, you know, pretty clear what the effects are in the printer's opinion. They're negative, <laughs> quite negative. And if you only know two things about the Boston Massacre, they should be this. Uh, first, it was pretty much a breaking point in a long period of rising tension, uh, beginning with colonists' unrest over new laws and taxes in the 1760s. We had been a colony of England for quite some time at that point, and this was a time when our relationship with England was changing. So they were, the colonists were reacting to these changes, um, a lot of the big things you've heard of, including the Stamp Act. In October 1768, uh, British troops arrived in Boston to act as a police force. There was one soldier for every four civilians in Boston when those soldiers arrived. So it was a pretty overwhelming force. And the image I have up on the screen here is a picture of those British troops arriving in Boston Harbor. Now soldiers and locals clashed repeatedly, but usually it was just a brawl. At the same time, patriots clashed with merchants who refused to participate in the boycott of English goods. On February 22, 1770, a loyalist Bostonian fired into a crowd of hecklers and harassers and killed 11-year-old Christopher Snyder, also known as Christopher Snyder. And the Patriots remembered this boy as a martyr. Some of them considered him the first death of the American Revolution. Then, on March 2, 1770, a large fistfight broke out on the docks between soldiers looking for jobs to pick up in their off-duty hours and locals who felt that their own jobs were threatened. And this had been a consistent tension since the arrival of the troops about a year and a half before. Uh, but this particular brawl just happened to be particularly large as the tensions were really escalating. Um, and so this happened on March 2nd. Three days later, the Boston Massacre occurred, uh, not far from where the rope walk brawl had taken place. And in fact, it included many of the same people, both from the colonist side and the soldier side. The second thing that you need to know about the Boston Massacre, and those of you well-versed in Boston history already know this, it wasn't a massacre. Five people died. Um, it was very much a multi-sided event that escalated from a small argument into a riot as more and more people participated and it got more and more rowdy and violent. Colonists were attacking the soldiers with clubs, sticks, dirty snowballs. Uh, there's rumors that some of these dirty snowballs contained rocks, chunks of ice, possibly even manure. Um, so these were very unpleasant. And it's up for debate whether the soldiers actually needed to fire into the crowd in order to defend themselves, but it's 
absolutely certain that they did not shoot unprovoked. This was definitely a multi-sided event. Um, the colonists were really instigating the violence and the soldiers were responding. Whether they responded proportionally is a matter of historical debate and of personal opinion. Um, but the reason that we remember this as a massacre is because of the propaganda storm that ensued. So the reason that we call it a massacre, even though five people died, is really what we're gonna be talking about um, in looking at these images from that time period. So here's one of the iconic images associated with the Boston Massacre. And I've heard it said that the reason there are only four coffins rather than five is that we didn't care about the black man who died. Um, and that's Crispus Attucks. But if you look at the initials on the coffins, you'll see that's not quite right. We do have Crispus Attucks represented here. Uh, Boston certainly had its share of racism in the 1770s, but that doesn't actually explain this image. In fact, the image was first printed before the last victim of the massacre died on March 17th. Um, so here we have an addendum in the newspaper um, showing the last victim. So now you have all five of these victims um, in the paper with their own coffin. Um, now let's talk about propaganda. The image of the coffins was printed as an illustration of the news article that announced the massacre. The version I have up here is dated March 12th, which is uh, unsurprising because most of the major papers in Boston at the time were weekly or bi-weekly. So by the time it was printed, most of town already knew about the event. But this is not your everyday obituary, right? This is eye-catching. This is, this is a big deal. Oh, sorry. The symbolism here is fairly easy to read. Um, so one of these uh, coffins in particular had a lot of symbolism on it. Um, and we have a skull and crossbones symbolizing death. And there's also a scythe. And depictions of a scythe on its own as, and instead of a, a stand-in for the Grim Reaper are less common. Um, but there are other examples. And this is a skeleton with a scythe, or scythe on a colonial gravestone. So you've got that here. Um, basically the same thing, and basically the same thing when you see a modern depiction of the Grim Reaper as a, a hooded figure with that scythe. Um, so again, symbolizing death. And the hourglass here is a very common colonial symbol of human mortality. And here's another uh, Boston gravestone example of that. That one's from the Granary Burial Ground. Um, last, we have the 17 here, um, noting that uh, this particular victim, Samuel Maverick, was only 17 when he died. Interestingly, James Caldwell, another of the victims, was just as young, but that's, his age was not noted in the image. So we just have the one um, being recognized as having died as only a teenager. Um, and Samuel Maverick actually uh, made it home before he died and ended up dying in his mother's arms. So it's possible that the reason that he was particularly singled out as having been just a teenager when this happened is because of that kind of you know, story that tugs at your heartstrings a bit. Now I wanna move on to the piece of propaganda that you were probably thinking of when you heard the topic of this talk. As some of you may know, Paul Revere actually plagiarized his famous print of the Boston Massacre. It was first made by Henry Pelham, who was the half-brother of John Singleton Copley, and he was an artist in his own right but Revere printed his version without Pelham's permission. And you can see here that apart from the coloring, there are very few differences. I have uh, Pelham's version over here and Revere's version over here. Um, there's some different signage on the building. Uh, Revere added the moon, things like that. Revere added a lot of blood. Um, but other than that, the images are fairly similar. Um, there's really no question that, that the one was copied from the other. The image was created as, uh, and circulated as a broadside, uh, which is like a large flyer. If you remember how many newspapers had full-page American flag images in the wake of September 11th, 2001, uh, think of broadside distribution kind of like that, although these weren't uh, intended to be displayed in windows. It's kind of the same, uh, same idea. Um, and the title of this broadside is The Bloody Massacre Perpetrated in King Street. Um, and Bloody Massacre actually became one of the common names used for this event um, even before Boston Massacre became the name that we, that we know it by. And here at the bottom, there's a three-verse poem, and uh, it's about the event, and it has uh, the, the names of the five people who died. And it also says, six wounded, two of them mortally. 
In fact, Christopher Monk, who's listed here, did die of the wounds that he sustained at the Boston Massacre, but not until 10 years later. Um, he ended up with a, a somewhat lifelong disability and died of infection related to that. So it was a death of the Boston Massacre. Some people do consider him the sixth victim. Um, but it was a little bit uh, premature to say that he was mortally wounded since it took 10 years to find that out and this, this image was printed in 1770. Um, and then the other person listed as mortally wounded, John Clark, in fact recovered, although he did also end up dying young for other reasons. Um, so there we've got the, the kind of the text at the bottom is what's accompanying this image when people were first uh, exposed to it in 1770. Now let's take a closer look at this famous picture. Um, so I'm gonna kind of open it up to folks in the crowd now and I just wanna ask you guys, what do you see here? Either something you've been shown before or something that you're just noticing while you take a look at it today. Colonists look very innocent. The colonists look very innocent, yeah. And what do you see that makes you say that? Um, well, they show the British fighting, but the colonists, you know, just running, falling back from them, not doing anything. Exactly. So the colonists aren't doing anything, they're just sort of falling back. And notice we don't see any weapons in their hands. No sticks, no clubs, not even a dirty snowball. Um, so they very much look innocent, they very much look like the victims. And already we have an image that looks incredibly one-sided. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else notice anything? They have all the uh, British soldiers firing at once, point blank. Yeah, absolutely. And so what does having all of the soldiers fire at once make you think of, either you or anyone else? Execution, firing squad, absolutely. Um, so we've got this very uh, militaristic or you know, firing squad um, concept here, and they did not actually all fire at once. Um, the shots were, were definitely scattershot. It was, um, it's known that one, one of these soldiers did fire first, and then it was really never determined what the order was after that. Um, but they weren't all in a line. They were probably attempting to maintain something of a semicircle for defensive purposes, but not doing very well at that. Because of course, in the real version, we don't have this you know, several foot gap between the crowd of colonists standing around and the soldiers. This was a riot that was threatening to erupt into a brawl. Um, so they were being pushed around. So they certainly weren't all in a line and they weren't firing all at the same time. So that's another thing that makes them look pretty bad makes the colonists look very innocent. The British commanding officer is standing behind them, like apparently exhorting them all to shoot. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got him with his bayonet raised. Um, this is Captain Preston. Very much looks like he's giving the order to fire. Thank you. Um, in fact, he actually stood in front of his men for a good portion of the night, so they couldn't fire without shooting him in the back. Of course, he had been pushed out of the way by the time the shots actually rang out. Um, but having him give the order, it's another thing that makes it look uh, like a firing squad or an execution, or at least very mil militaristic, um, makes it look organized. Um, and that's definitely one of the main things that distinguishes this version from the actual version, is just how organized this version is. Yeah, yes. The sign, the butcher's hall behind the, the British soldiers kind of adds to the yeah. idea that the they're slaying them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So the sign Butcher's Hall makes it look like they're slaying them. Thank you. That's, that's one of my favorite details and one of the ones we're going to be talking more about in, in a bit. Oh, yes. Um, so what she said was that there's this sign up here that says Butcher's Hall that's right over the soldiers' heads. And so it's kind of a way to emphasize that the soldiers are just slaying these colonists. They're just butchering them. Um, oops, pardon me. The, uh, the pointer and the clickers are right next to one another there. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, uh, was that Butcher's Hall sign in it before Paul Revere copied it? Great question. No, that's actually one of the things that Revere added. Um, so Paul Revere was an expert propagandist. Uh, that's one of the reasons we still know his name today. Of course, you know, Longfellow had a bit of a hand in us still knowing uh, Revere's name. But why was Revere the one that Longfellow thought of? Revere was really good at being in the right place at the right time, and he was also really good at spin. Um, so while this image definitely had a lot of spin before Revere got his hands on it, um, that sign, Butcher's Hall, is one of the things that he added. 
forgive me if I'm wrong, but I had always thought that Revere had done a different uh, configuration that was more accurate from eyewitness accounts, and then Samuel Adams told him, directed him to uh, do this account. Am I wrong? I, I, that's what I've heard in, in reading biographies of Samuel Adams, I believe, and things, that, that he was the spinmeister and Paul was following orders somewhat. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, were, weren't the soldiers actually like, defending the State House and their backs to it facing out? So this would be to give it a different perspective as well. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Um, I haven't read that detail about Samuel Adams sort of orchestrating Paul Revere's version. Uh, I would believe it. Samuel Adams was also an expert propagandist. Um, and Revere, you know, they certainly worked together on a lot of things. And one thing that Revere did do, although he himself was not a witness, he created a diagram that was um, kind of akin to something that you might see in a courtroom proceeding in terms of reconstructing uh, where individuals were based on those eyewitness accounts. Um, it doesn't look like this. It's very much a street diagram with you know, little dots and names. Um, so that might be the, the image that you're thinking of. It's, it's possible that, that I hadn't heard of it, but that he was planning to do something that more closely reflected that diagram that he made. So yeah, that's, that's absolutely possible. Um, and in terms of the configuration, um, so there's a sign right below Butcher's Hall that, I'm sorry, uh, that says Customs House here. And the, the soldier who was initially involved in this argument uh, with the colonists had been standing guard in front of the Customs House. That was his post. He was patrolling. Um, and so the, the fight basically broke out in front of the Customs House, which was right across the street from the old State House, as we call it today. At the time, it was called the Town House. Um, and that was the seat of colonial government. Um, so the royal governor who was appointed by the king, his office is behind this window right here. Now this took place uh, during the evening, so he wasn't in his office. Um, but so this is right across the street, and um, where they're standing is fairly accurate, but it's absolutely true that there is a conscious choice behind displaying it from this perspective. So coming up, looking up King Street at the State House, you really have this idea of here's our government, both the elected representatives and the colonial authority are working in this building. So it's a pretty powerful statement to make that really the center and the backdrop of this image. Thanks. All right, so we're going to move on to a couple of my favorite details here in this image. Um, a few of my favorite bits of propaganda and symbolism, starting with this little dog who's at the very bottom of the image. Um, so in the 18th century, dogs were depicted in art to mean any and all of the things that we might use them to, uh, to mean today in art or in political cartoons, anything of that sort. Um, for example, loyalty, as in man's best friend. Uh, that might be what it means in this 1763 Copley portrait of a Massachusetts woman here on the left. Um, so we've got this little dog in her lap. Um, and dogs can also be used to show fier fierceness or wildness which might be what's going on in this 18th century cartoon of an impressment gang. We have this uh, dog sort of nipping at the people's heels here. And also at the, in the 18th century, dogs were al also used to denote an urban scene. So all of these things are possible. I think there's three main ways that we can read the little dog in the Boston Massacre print. One, as a declaration that the colonists were loyal subjects, which makes this treatment doubly cruel. And at the time, the people of Boston really did consider themselves Englishmen. They were, both legally and culturally. Um, so even the ones who were protesting, it wasn't a stretch to say that they were loyal subjects. They were loyal subjects who had very serious concerns with what their government was doing. Um, this is still about five years before people were talking seriously about independence. And alternatively, this dog could be a pun. And we could read it as calling the soldiers dogs. Um, and of course, it could be there to make the, the colonists look like they're minding their own business, just out walking their dogs. Uh, people rarely used leashes at the time, so this would be a completely accurate you know, description of someone walking along with the dog sort of you know, within a few feet or a few yards of them. Um, and so then we would imagine that this colonist was out innocently, is innocently walking with their dog when they got caught up in this violence when in fact many of these colonists were really involved in the rioting beforehand. Now let's talk about those innocent colonists. The people who were at the massacre were mostly working class. 
They were apprentices, dock workers, rope makers, and so on. They were the people who were in direct competition with soldiers for those jobs. And they were the people who turned up in the scuffles in, uh, between soldiers and colonists in the streets, including the one the previous Friday. And this image below is actually a 19th century depiction of colonial clothing, but it's fairly accurate for the, for the working class. We have loose, practical clothing made in basic shapes. But the colonists whose clothes we get details of in this picture seem to be pretty well off. We've got the uh, pants that are custom fit and tapered at the knee instead of long and square. We've got the coordinated vest and coat. Uh, compare them to this portrait of John Hancock. Uh, you'll see that the, the outline and kind of the style is fairly similar. Dressing them this way appealed to the conscious or unconscious classism of many of the viewers. These victims looked like respectable gentlemen. And so that means that a wider swath of the viewers are going to relate to or uh, you know, feel like these, these victims were truly victims, truly innocent, you know, upstanding citizens. Now we already talked a bit about Butcher's Hall, and I don't have to explain to you what that means. Um, but I will mention that the sign hangs just above the customs house where the British collected taxes, as well as over the soldiers' heads. And this is one of the de details that Revere himself added, or perhaps another propagandist suggested this, but it wasn't in uh, Henry Pelham's version. And so he's calling the soldiers butchers and by extension, the British government. And if we want to go a little bit deeper, butchering was considered a particularly undesirable profession. Apart from being messy and smelly, many people in the 18th century felt that butchering tainted the people who did the work, making them cruder and meaner than they otherwise would have been. Kind of a, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it sort of attitude, but also with this idea that the more you did it, you know, the more it kind of affected you. Um, and so this British drawing on the, on the right here from 1773 lampoons two extremes in society, the conceited dandy and the crass butcher. Um, and so this cartoon actually has the butcher uh, cu cutting off the ponytail of the dandy. Um, and they're really, you know, kind of counterpoints to each other. The one who's so refined that he's ridiculous, and the one who's kind of this, this uh, crass, gross guy who's kind of the buffoon of the scene. Um, and so there's this other element of sort of um, classism or, or showing people who are being described as butchers, in addition to being described as violent, they're being described as crude. Now, back to the massacre image, another thing that Revere added is this right here. Let me get the pointer to uh, point right, the gun out of the window. Um, in fact, two witnesses did testify to seeing this happen, but they later recanted. Might remind you of a 20th century uh, discussion of extra shooters uh, happening in, in a famous event. Um, but yeah, there was, there was no shooter out of the window. But if there had been, what does that imply? It probably implies that this was planned, that someone knew to go up there. Um, and so of course that would be horribly incriminating. Um, and so it didn't actually happen, but that detail is in Revere's version. Now, in the back of the crowd of colonists, we see a figure shrouded in black, hands clasped together. And the hat or the bonnet is ambiguous, but the shawl makes it look like this figure is portraying a woman. Women were actively discouraged from participating in street violence. It was considered improper as well as unsafe. This certainly didn't stop all women. In fact, there were a couple of instances of street violence that were specifically initiated by groups of women. Um, but I don't think that this woman is here to represent the fact that women may have been present at the Boston Massacre. Um, rather, women at the time were seen as keepers of the sentimental or emotional side of life, as well as keepers of the home. And this mournful, worried figure, seemingly separate from the fray and wringing her hands, may be here to lend a tragic air to the scene. Uh, compare her to the mourners in this piece of embroidery from a few decades later. Um, so we've got this kind of same sort of body language and, and this air of mourning. Um, my personal theory is that she's also here to represent the idea of home, which is something that women were used for in literature and in art. Um, and this is an idea of saying that the soldiers had invaded Bostonians' home, which was definitely something that was on a lot of people's minds during the years that those soldiers were here. And before we move on, here's the whole image again. 
This was circulated throughout the colonies along with news of the event. There are lots of little details in this image that we can interpret as propaganda. Just like in reading a text, some of the symbolism may have been unintentional, um, but anything that affects the reader or the viewer is important to discuss, whether or not the uh, author or the uh, artist actually intended it to be there. Um, so here again, we have this iconic image of the Boston Massacre. I'm pretty sure this was on the cover of one of my history textbooks growing up. Um, it's certainly an image that's repeated again and again, even in our memory of the event, not just how it was discussed in the 1770s. Now, while I wanted to focus on the images, a discussion of propaganda around the Boston Massacre wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention these two documents, both published in 1770. The one on the left was printed by Eads and Gill, who were Patriot printers in Boston. Um, and it's rumored to have been authored by Samuel Adams. The one on the right was authored in response in London. And you can imagine, it tells a pretty different version of the story. Um, so the titles we have are a short narrative of the horrid massacre in Boston, perpetrated in the evening of the fifth day of March, etc., cetera, uh, by the soldiers who were then quartered there with some observations on the state of things prior to that catastrophe. So this is compiled from eyewitness accounts. Um, and it absolutely has a point of view. You can even tell by the name, you know, massacre, catastrophe, and it's really, you know, describing this as something that may have almost been inevitable based on what was going on in Boston at the time, but is also very firmly laying the blame at the feet of those soldiers and the British government who had sent them there. Now, in contrast, we have a fair account of the late unhappy disturbance at Boston in New England. Um, extracted from the depositions that have been made concerning it by the persons of all parties. So both of these are formed from eyewitness accounts. Um, there were many, many depositions that were taken in the days and the weeks following the Boston Massacre, even though it took months and months for a trial to actually take place. These depositions were collected early, and because of these two publications, many of them were made available to the public even before these trials took place. Um, but you can imagine pretty different ideas of what happened there. Um, so there are many sides to this story, and many different versions of them were being told. Now, the Boston Massacre has been used in other forms of propaganda throughout American history. This image, which puts Crispus Attucks front and center, shows him as a martyr fighting for the Patriot cause. This was published in 1856. And Crispus Attucks was an African-American and part Native American man. And so you can imagine why some Americans would be thinking about whether African-Americans had a role in the American Revolution in 1856. This is Civil War propaganda. This is abolitionist propaganda, saying correctly that African-Americans have been a part of this country from the beginning, um, and really assigning Crispus Attucks this you know, central role. One thing that's interesting about this image is that it does show the colonists with clubs and sticks. Um, so by this point in sort of our narrative, this idea that the colonists were fighting was not considered a bad thing. It's really showing them almost as freedom fighters because we still have these soldiers very much looking cruel, very much looking like a firing squad. Um, and then we have these colonists standing up to them, Crispus Attucks being the one front and center really kind of uh, carrying the whole image. So that's 1856. This monument commemorating the Boston Massacre was built on the Boston Common in 1888. We could spend at least a half hour, maybe even an hour, discussing the symbolism in this monument alone. And we're not going to do that today. Um, but as it was built more than a century after the event, I won't say that it was propaganda. You can decide that for yourself. But symbolism and narratives constructed by people with their own points of view are always a part of how we shape our collective memory of events. And this statue and this engraving are no different. Uh, we've certainly got a lot of symbolism about liberty, about what it means to be American, about how this country was founded. So with that, I'm going to close my formal presentation, but we do still have time for questions or comments if there are any. This was just kind of skimming the surface in a lot of ways of a pretty complicated issue. So I'd be happy to, to hear what you guys have to think or have to say.
I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, how many days after the event did you say Revere's print was put out? Um, that was approximately two weeks after the event. So it was, okay. it was very much uh, within, you know, recent memory, within the press storm that happened right afterwards. So it was already also building up for the trial then? Hmm? It was already, it wasn't with just a day or two. I'm sorry, what was the question? It wasn't just a day or it two. It wasn't just a day okay. or two, no. Um, so they were already well on their way towards planning the trial. Yes, yes. So the, the trial didn't actually take place until it began in October of that year. So there was quite some time, but people already had begun taking depositions. Um, something to remember is that newspapers weren't publishing as frequently at the time. So it was commonplace for everyone in town to hear about something before it made the papers. But the papers were also kind of shaping and reshaping how people are talking about it. But yeah, thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, this wasn't, or I'm not gesturing to it anymore, uh, but the image wasn't right away. Yeah. Yes. Um, how far, how widely was this uh, 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 broadside of the massacre uh, uh, disseminated? Did it go to the, all the colonies, I mean, sort of mailed around, or people carried it? I, I can see it would be around Boston and the communities there, but how about uh, the rest of the middle colonies in the south? That's a fantastic question. How widely was the image disseminated? Um, I don't have specific numbers, but I do know that it was, it was very widely. It was definitely in uh, other colonies. I know that it was in Virginia, for example, so it was, it was throughout the colonies. Um, and that was largely because of the way that newspapers communicated with one another at the time. Um, you know, they didn't have the Associated Press, but they did have a, kind of a mutual agreement between many, many newspapers that it was acceptable and welcomed to reprint stories from other papers. And so frequently, newspapers would have a local affairs section, which would be their own content, and then, you know, essentially North American affairs, although they weren't calling it that, and they would often reprint something that had appeared in another newspaper a few days before. Um, so both the news articles and this image um, were being reprinted uh, in many different parts of the colonies. Yeah. I just wondered how long it would take to get around. How long it would take to get around? For example, how long would it take to get down to Virginia? Um, I, that's a great question, and I don't know off the top of my head what was typical. Um, I know that uh, for example, it took about usually two weeks from Philadelphia to Boston in a, um, you know, a, a casual pace. Um, so for example, when they're uh, moving the Declaration of Independence from place to place, typical was two weeks, although, uh, excuse me, <coughs> oh, my microphone, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, it was, that was about typical, but it could be done in nine days if you really kind of powered through and didn't particularly care about the well-being of your horse or had another horse you could trade off partway through the journey. Um, so that's just to Philadelphia. So it would have taken months to get to some parts of the colony. And people expected that at the time in terms of how they reacted to news. They, they knew that some of the news they were getting was coming weeks or months late. I just wanted to let people know that one year and around the 4th of July, they did a reenactment of the trial in the State House. Yes, yeah. And it was very interesting. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, the old state house, which is uh, the building, oh, I keep pointing as if it's that image right there. Maybe I'll, I'll go back while we're talking about it. We might as well, yeah. So the old state house, which is the building right there, um, is a, a, a nonprofit museum. They're kind of one of our neighbor sites. Um, and they do annually a reenactment of the Boston Massacre. It's usually the Saturday after the anniversary. Um, and they frequently do some other programming around that, um, including reenactments of the trial. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful program. Um, and it's kind of a, a nice compliment because we annually reenact the debates leading up to the Boston Tea Party, which took place three years later. Um, but that's in December, so different time of the year, uh, more of that kind of 1770s spirit. Where was the trial? It was in the uh, courthouse that was on Queen Street at the time, which was uh, the street kind of behind the old state house up there. That street is now called Court Street. And there is another courthouse on that street, but it is not the original. It was built a little bit later. In fact, the colony court uh, that was kind of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts at the time had been housed in one of the rooms of the old state house, but that was the year that they had determined that it had outgrown the space that it was using. 
So that was the year this new courthouse was being constructed. And so by the time the Boston Massacre trials actually took place, it was in that new courthouse up the street. I just found it interesting, the, the butchery thing, because five years later, after April 19th, 1775, and we're from Lexington, um, they, the, the broadside that was put out with, um, I guess, Paul Revere and Samuel Adams was bloody, with, there was a big broadside, bloody butchery of the, by the British troops of the colonists, when in fact, the colonists actually had, the, the British had three times the casualties almost exactly three times the casualties of the, uh, of the colonists, and, and the propaganda was so blatant. Yes. And, and, they, and it echoes this, where, you say, where it said the butchery and, and that one as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Certainly subtlety was not always a hallmark of the propaganda at the time, but again, this idea of, of butchery and of really um, emphasizing the violence of what the soldiers were doing. You yeah. also, thank you, Tegan, and... Um, yeah. Thank you. Ben really was not just writing articles and reproducing death notices, but was able to actually practice some writing. In particular, some of us know that Benjamin Franklin is known for one persona he adopted, silence do good.